Good afternoon and welcome to this uh, more educational session, How to Become a Master in Ophthalmology. And we have given it the undertitled Training Opportunities for All, uh, which will be one of the topics. Um, I will first introduce myself. My name is Marie Louise Rasmussen. I'm the SOEO chair, but uh, actually today, my co chair Miguel is taking over. <laughs> And uh, Miguel, Miguel is the new Yo SOE chair for this society. <laughs> and uh, we're really happy for all our speakers uh, that they had taken the opportunity to come. Uh, our first speaker is uh, the chair of the American Academy, uh, Yo committee, Janice Law, who will tell us about ophthalmology training in the US, where it's, which direction it's taking. Thank you. Hello. Yes. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Marie Louise, thank you for the invitation. Um, and I especially like this topic. I'm an educator. I am the director of medical student education at my institution at Vanderbilt Eye Institute in Nashville, Tennessee. Previous to that, I was the associate residency director for eight years at uh, Vanderbilt. So um, I'm very invested in where ophthalmology training is headed, especially in the U.S. So this topic is apropos. And I don't have any financial um, interest or uh, conflicts, except that I have interest, for sure, in making sure our ophthalmology trainees in the US um, come out competent and, uh, and healthy, too. So I'm going to cover these five topics uh, regarding where the US training programs are headed. We're going to talk about how we have so little time and uh, the newest change, which is integrated internships. I'll talk about data-driven curriculum, integrating interactive education, and I'll also talk about our uh, increase in culture of uh, patient safety through quality improvement projects. And then physician well-being is a very important topic to us in training. Um, so due to the expansion of medical knowledge in ophthalmology, the expansion of surgical procedures, new techniques, it's so hard to fit everything into our three years of residency training. So we talked about, for several years, deliberated on the possibility of expanding our ophthalmology training. So go from three years to four years. And you know that's not going to be a popular uh, choice for a lot of our trainees to make training longer. So we looked at it, and we looked at it, and we found a creative way to get more ophthalmology in inside our residency training. So new, starting in 2021, this, is, this just came out a few months ago, um, the ACGME, which is our accrediting uh, board, is asking us to, co to create integrated internships. So let me talk about how we traditionally have done it. So traditional US training looks like this, four years of medical school, then you go into an internship, which is 12 months, and you're technically a free agent. I can do an internship in California, and then I can do training in Tennessee. Or I can do an internship at Harvard in, in um, Massachusetts, and then I can go to Texas for my training. So you're a free agent. You can do that separately. And during your 12 months of internship, you can study any of the topics in internal medicine or primarily general surgery, or what we call a transitional year, which is a little bit of a mixture of both with a lot of electives. And you would be practicing like this gentleman here who is writing hypertensive medication prescriptions and managing chest pain. That's an internship. Then you go on to do your three years of residency. And your three years or 36 months of residency can be at that other location, like I said. So then you complete your training, and then you move on, take your boards. And that's our traditional training. But in two years from now, we are mandating what we're calling an integrated internship. And that now will look like this, four years of medical school, nine months of internship. And this is a creative way of finding more efficient training in that intern year. Yes, we do believe that uh, practicing as a general medicine physician is important. We, we need to have that foundation. But some of those rotations and electives that they um, experience in their internship isn't always directly related to the skill set of an ophthalmologist. So, we creatively are finding three months in that intern year uh, to take it away and put it into ophthalmology. 
And unfortunate, well, fortunate, I think, um, when you do this integrated internship, you'll be doing it at the same institution. So no flying to Texas and going to another state. Uh, it will be all at the same institution. So you start off as your uh, intern year at the institution that you are training for ophthalmology. So again, you can choose internal medicine, general surgery, or transitional year. Then you have your three months of ophthalmology inside that one year. Then you move on to do your traditional 36 months of ophthalmology residency. And just to, uh, to uh, illustrate it another way, you can see that, I'm gonna use this pointer here, you can see that you still end at the same time. So the training length has not lengthened. Uh, however, we're doing a little less of this more general medicine or general surgery internship and a little, uh, so here, yeah, a little less of that in this, um, in this um, figure. So what we get is 12 additional weeks of ophthalmology. And as educators, we are super excited about that because why wouldn't we want to teach you more of that versus more of ICU intensive care knowledge? We really want you to know more about the new surgical techniques and the different things we want to include in our uh, curriculum. So let me tell you about some of the other benefits from this, not just added content. You actually, since you are showing up on day one to your institution, you get to learn the hospital system. You get to learn the program culture. Uh, you get to learn about their electronic medical records and start using it right away. So you don't have that steep learning curve of, I have to learn how to use their medical records and how to report to these people and learn ophthalmology all at the same time. You don't have that stress. So at the beginning of your internship, you get to just ease your way into uh, the system. You get to learn more about your program faculty and peers and um, then, of course, you learn more basic skills sooner. So we're allowing the skill set to be shifted earlier. So uh, now in their intern year, they're going to be more facile with the slit lamp, with indirect ophthalmoscopy, with refraction and retinoscopy and keratometry and gonioscopy and the everything. So the exposure is going to be very positive. Um, and that'll allow programs to also find time at the end of that 36 months. Now that everything's shifted, maybe we can do mini fellowships. So there are a lot of residents who want to spend a little more time in glaucoma or a little more time getting ready for fellowship or maybe spending more time learning more about whether or not they want to apply for oculoplastics. So this allows, this finds room in, in the curriculum. And then if there are uh, residents that are struggling, well, then they'll be able to repeat a couple of rotations and get on their feet. So that's another benefit. And my belief of this is that uh, it should improve physician wellness overall. I think it'll have an indirect benefit because then you've reduced anxiety, you've reduced isolation, you are now in with your your crowd, you're, you're there, um, and you're starting to develop your uh, social relationships much sooner. Because if you think about doing an internship in Texas and then you move to Boston, you have to make new friends, you have to get acclimated, that does take a lot of time. The next topic is improving on our data-driven curriculum. So we are very data-driven and data-heavy, and we like to let data inform us on how our education programs are doing. So in 2012 or so uh, is when the ACGME, again, our accrediting body, had uh, printed and published our milestones. And if you're not familiar with the US milestones, the milestones are uh, basically taking apart what an ophthalmologist needs to do or know, making them achievable steps, and then giving you an opportunity to have it written out, described, and you are able to assess your trainees based on their abilities to achieve those steps. So it allows for meaningful assessments. We can look at um, descriptively how well a resident is able to do a particular step in a procedure or how, they're allowed, how well they speak to patients. Um, and then by using these, we then look to see at our program how well we're doing as a whole. So this is just an example. It's kind of small up there, but I have a big one coming up. Non-surgical therapy, I'll just go over one of them. Um, level three, describes indications for oral and IV therapy and recognizes possible racial, gender, and genomic differences in outcome of medical therapy. So someone may come in already being able to do level three but we want to see them progress. So then there's a level four to be looking forward to. And I like to use this also as a tool for the um, learners themselves. They should be able to look at this and say, this is what I need to strive for. So the milestones are um, a very positive change that has happened to our curriculum. Here's an example of cornea. So uh, I blew this up a little bit bigger for people to see, and I also put it on a PDF for a QR code. If you haven't seen these milestones uh, or have implemented any of the information in there, go ahead and um, turn your 
smartphone on if you've got one, turn on the camera and um, just point it at the QR code and you should be able to grab that PDF that I linked it to. You can have that. So this is the appendix to our ACGME milestones. The appendix has uh, the different specialties listed as the different surgical uh, techniques you should be able to learn. I'm only showing cornea. I'm a retina specialist. I decided not to do the retina one. But you can find retina, plastics, cornea, glaucoma, neuro. You can find them all. So uh, this is just an example. But if you look at the levels, level two, you should be able to perform a corneal foreign body removal at slit lamp. A level three, you should be able to perform suture removal at slit lamp. Level four, you should be able to perform an LRI or limbal relaxing incision uh, as part of your cataract surgery. So as our learners progress through this stage, we can see how well they're able to achieve what we want them to achieve by the end of graduation. And all that to say is that all of those things are being updated. So because it's been around six to seven years, the ACGME and uh, many ophthalmologists that are on this committee are looking at the data to see how helpful has it been, is it accurate, is it going to inform us of what other milestones need to come, uh, come along, or how can we modify the description so that they really are true to life. Uh, so that'll give us more meaningful feedback. And then I, one more thing about milestones and surgical minimums is that these numbers are also being evaluated. So um, this is not always data driven, actually. These numbers uh, can, are somewhat, um, I'm not sure if they were just decided upon, uh, but some of them are also are, are truly data driven from like the cataract surgery uh, minimums. So a study was shown that uh, no more than 80 surgical um, experiences of primary cataract surgeries made that made their uh, competency any any better. So um, that minimum is 86. And then there are some other numbers here. You can see that there are single digits, and those are. Um, somewhat random. So they're going to be looking at those numbers and looking to see how we can improve that. Um, we're going to be improving our uh, the way we do interactive education. So I'll be showing you some examples of how we're using um, interactive modules for surgical simulation. Um, coming soon is the Cataract Master, which is not yet available for prime time, but I'll show that real quick. And um, we are uh, implementing virtual reality and 3D training. So if you go to the aao.org and you go to the resident section, or if you go into the search function and just look for some of these, just type in surgical simulation or training modules, you'll see some of these modules are available. So some of you may already know that the pathology module is there, and that is free for everybody, even if you don't have a membership. Uh, then we have the ROP uh, case-based training module, where it gives you a case-based scenario. You have to look at the picture and identify uh, what type of ROP this is and would you initiate training, uh, 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 treatment. Then there's the retinoscopy simulator, uh, where it can show you the different streaks and you have to uh, be able to assess the, uh, um, the measurements. And then also measuring strabismus, and we showed this in the Yo Lounge if some of you were there yesterday. So these are all available. These are all free without a membership, but these are ways to be more interactive and finding um, multimodal ways to teach. So the Cataract Master is coming soon, so you will not see this on the aao.org yet. This was invented by um, Bonnie Henderson and John Lobenstein at, at Harvard, and this is more of a choose-your-own-adventure simulation for cataract surgery. So it'll give you different scenarios, uh, real-life scenarios that you might um, come into contact with, and then as you go through them, you have to make these decisions, and that leads to another decision, that leads to another decision, so it really applies uh, your cognitive decision-making ability. So coming soon, I would look for that. I think it's really exciting. And then, of course, you know, there's heads-up display in 3D uh, surgery. So it doesn't make any sense to have all this without our residents having practiced that. And so a lot of the 3D heads-up microscopes are coming to uh, training programs so that we can go from patient experiences to uh, wet lab to dry lab into 3D, uh, 3D labs. And lastly, well, I think this is the second to last, is quality improvement. So quality improvement projects are now part of our ACGME requirements for graduation. Um, and this is important because uh, it allows our residents to implement two areas of the core competencies, and that is systems-based practice and problem-based learning and improvement. So basically looking at your system, looking at how you operate within your clinic, how you operate within your OR, how you operate within the hospital system, what errors might be occurring, what protocols may need to be put in place for patient safety, medication errors, or maybe even looking at um, whether or not there's communication breakdown. So it really allows the resident to dissect that and to be able to develop a quality improvement project around these uh, learning points. And overall, the department's going to improve in building a culture of safety, so it's all good for patients. 
And lastly is uh, physician well-being. Uh, as we know that over 50% of medical students and residents are depressed, uh, and that leads to burnout, and our suicide rate is increasing amongst our healthcare providers. So the um, ACGMA made this a, a very important um, priority to include physician well-being in our residencies. So ophthalmology training is now including how to train yourself to be healthier, how to make healthy decisions, sleep better, but also the program is uh, mandated to ensure protected time with patients so you're not rushed through your patient visits, uh, minimizing non-physician obligations, uh, ensuring an environment free of harassment and coercion, and providing residents and fellows with time for personal medical and dental care. And I personally, I can, re I can remember back being in residency, I've never seen a dentist until like the last month of residency, you just don't have time. But that's, as healthcare providers, uh, that would be bad role modeling for our own patients. So these are the things that are coming this way. So integrated internships will be a very positive change. Curricula will be positively affected by reviewing data and our milestone data. Interactive and multimodality learning will enhance physicians' skills and knowledge. QI projects or quality improvement projects will set the stage for improving patient care and a culture of safety. And new wellness mandates, uh, physician wellness mandates, will focus on increasing and modeling healthy habits. And that's it. Thank you. Now we can move to the next speaker, Cristina Grubcheva. We are delighted to have here Cristina. She's the uh, current president of the European Board of Ophthalmology. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. Uh, so we are turning the matter upside down now because first of all, in Europe, the four year of residence training is compulsory. Uh, so it's, it's different than the United States and also the medical education usually uh, and typically in Europe is six years. Uh, so we are studying more and we need to intensify this time. I was wondering should I put my disclosures because most of those participations are actually in teaching activities when I have been teaching residency uh, all over Europe with the support of the companies, but I decided finally to put them. And I should say that the teaching historically changed significantly. I still remember uh, the time when uh, we were having a live demonstrations in the halls by the professor during the lectures. And actually in the past, the surgical training was exactly this. The operations were done publicly and people were observing them, like future surgeons, and they were absorbing the information out of it. So today, obviously, it is very different. So the question is how to become a master within this short period of time. So in ophthalmology, we are very specific because we need theoretical knowledge, and I should put this as number one. We need fine skills and this is number two, and we also need practice. So in order to be a good ophthalmologist, in order to be master in ophthalmology, you have to have those three components and they should work together at all time. So theoretical knowledge. Well, you're blessed people today because you have theoretical knowledge in your palm all the time. So you have millions of resources, and as mentioned, American Academy recently developed an app, and I recommend you to use this app because it is enormous resource for a variety of different things. But also, you have meetings and congresses, and you have also a variety of training schools. And I'm going to go by this. So first of all, you must be selective for your sources because you should not rely on anything. Yes, why iWiki is one of the uh, sites where you can go and you can find an information, but when you see something and you doubt it, be selective. Try to find evidence-based confirmation that this is exactly what it is. So you should be most of the time with your sources and you should try to find the best of knowledge you can. So meetings and congresses, obviously uh, most of the congresses today are driven to the young, uh, young program. And one good example is actually the uh, e ESCRS, who is organizing now a whole day program for you. 
And this program is usually done by a very interactive and very international committee. And it also, today, it gives you a variety of different tasks you to follow. So usually during those meetings, there are instruction courses. And today, at this particular meeting, you have a variety of options. And if you go upstairs on the third floor, you already, I hope, had been exposed to those. Another important thing is training schools. And I do urge you to look for those training schools, identify the ones that are suitable for you, and apply for them. And if your application is not successful on the first place, apply second time. The benefit of those things is that you're actually in a very close society with your peers. And this is important because isolated with your phone and the knowledge from webinars is not going to give you what exactly you need. So I think that those courses is something that gives you a broader perspective. You sort of uh, put up your watch together with your peers from different countries because Europe is very specific. We are not United States. In the United States, they have lots of things that are equal for the whole area. In Europe, we have national regulation. And because of the national regulations, we have a country-specific things. We have country-specific basic courses, which are on your own language. We have different kinds of interactions. And also, we have regulatory bodies that are looking at different countries. And we cannot really make everything absolutely equal. Also, you should not forget about the industry-driven courses. And I think that the industry today is completely different than the industry during my residency. Because during that time, they were trying to push their products. Today, it's completely different. They understand that if a clinician is educated enough, then they can be selective and try to implement into their practice what is, what is best for their patient. They understand that today, we are in the era of personalized medicine, which basically means that we need to have a variety of different instruments and combine them for this particular case. So finally, we are coming to the fine skills. And fine skills are including different things. So dry lab, wet lab, and simulators. And I would like to go through those in a little bit more detail. So dry labs. Dry labs are a very good thing because you're not using animal tissue. It's absolutely safe for you. Uh, it's relatively cheap and it's much easier to handle. You are not dependent on anything. You can organize it anytime. The only thing you need is probably the microscope, which again today is not a big problem. Unfortunately, the feeling that you have, although they are working on those material science, the feeling that you get there is not absolutely realistic. It's not a real tissue. Real tissue is having resistance that is changing. This material that is uh, there is actually with constant resistance, the resistance throughout entire act that, you, that you're doing, like suturing or making incisions and so on, even capsulorexis. So it's not really realistic, but it gives you pretty much an impression of how to master your fine skills. So what about wet lab? Well, wet lab is more realistic, but you agree that it's quite messy. I hope that some of you already have been to the wet lab. It's smelly uh, most of the time, and you need to be very careful because this is an animal tissue and it had not been tested. So you have to be a little bit precocious. Uh, in the past, and in some sites, for example, for plastic surgery, today they are still using cadavers, but this is, again, something controversial. But again, wet lab is not the real life. So now we are coming to the simulators. And I would like to start with something, and please remember this, expensive. If you are talking about simulators, the first word that you are going to hear will be expensive. I'm going, going to come back to this with an evidence-based medicine in about five minutes. So it requires expertise. But on the other hand, you can actually, as far as you're familiar with the simulator, stay there even without a supervisor and do as many scenarios 
as you wish. Gives you really unlimited opportunity for clinical and also for surgical skills. Actually, in direct ophthalmoscopy, direct ophthalmoscopy, and today also the slit lamp is something which is absolutely realistic. And you really can experience real life. And you really have a feedback because when you're doing it on a real patient, you really do not know how many mistakes you did. You know that you did not see something, but you have no idea why. The simulator is giving you a feedback, for example, for indirect ophthalmoscopy, that your lens was tilted, your lens was not in position, you were too far away, you were too close up, and that is why your image was not clear. So somehow, this clinical simulation, in my opinion, is something that everyone during their training should experience. Yes, we will have a variety of more options, virtual reality, I'm looking forward to it. And here's the place to say that you have to get used to it because from my perspective, I've been doing ophthalmic surgery for 30 years. And for me, doing a 3D surgery is a real challenge because somehow, all my life, I had been trained that surgery is a close-up work. So now I have to do the close-up and observe something which is theoretically infinity. So this is something that my brain learns, and it is a steep learning curve, but of course it is achievable. But for you, it can start from the moment when you are trained, and it's going to be much more easy. And of course, I know that everybody is gagging for practice. So working with the real patient, recognizing signs and symptoms, and finally make the diagnosis, differential diagnosis, and treat this patient. And how to treat them? Well, I know everybody wants surgery, surgery, surgery. And when it comes to surgery, I'm a little bit jealous. Jealous because when I was trained, the only option was that you do real patients. And trust me, it has the advantage that you really do surgery, but many disadvantages, including the well-being, because there is nothing more stressful than doing surgery and seeing that something is really happened and you know I'm not prepared, I'm not prepared and my supervisor is not prepared as well. What is going to happen? So simulators today really are going to reduce your complications, increase your life expectancy and I put money on that for the future and also, it is going to improve, and this is one of our common goal, it is going to improve really the quality of life of our patients as well, because you are going to perform for them better surgery. Simulators had been used in aviation for many, many years. I'm sure that most of you came here by plane, and you even did not think that maybe the pilot is not competent because they're using simulators before even they start to operate the planes. And those are all the advantages that had been proven in simulation in aviation. So cost effectiveness, risk-free, uh, instructional facilities, viability all the time, flights without risks, and so on. Yes, there are some disadvantages as well. And one of those is that it's not 100% realistic. In real life, you have factors that you never can simulate, or you cannot man make as many simulations as the real life can prepare for you, because the simulations are based on experience, and they are selective experience for people that implement their knowledge into the simulators. Also, you need additional skills to operate a simulator, and sometimes, you are actually much more stressed and much more tired when you are doing your real surgery because when you do the simulators, you are a little bit more relaxed. But of course, everything has disadvantages. So I would like to now draw your attention to a paper because I promised to talk about cost at the end. Paper that was done by John Ferret virtually last week. It is published and it shows very interesting things. So first of all, what it shows is that if you have somebody who never used the simulator and then train them with the simulator, 
the complications concentrated only on the rupture of the posterior capsule will reduce with 40%, 3.5 to 2.6. Interestingly, those complications for people who were trained and never used in their training anything, simulators or dry lab or wet lab, would be 3.8%. So much, much higher. This paper is available and you can read it for free because it's uh, full text available, but I would like to also uh, say what is the final conclusion of it. They did economical analysis and what they found is that the cost of two simulators per year for the area of London is going to cover the expenses if you have a capsular rupture for those particular patients. So the cost effectiveness of simulator is not anymore on the table because of course the vision of the society is much more important but also even economically we have an equation in which the simulators are paying their cost only for one year. So finally, I should highlight that the syllabus is available and it is available on the EBO webpage. But of course, you have to obey the rules in your own country and the rules in your own body. Because again, we are together in Europe, but everyone from each country is having their own regulations. So just to conclude, I should say that really ophthalmology is easy. It's riding a bike. However, riding a bike in fire, you are in fire as well. So everything, in fact, is in fire. So visit our webpage and you have some resources for training and for learning a little bit more. And with this, I would like to thank you very much. Then I would like to introduce our next speaker, Andrew Scott, who is a consultant in glaucoma and former chair of the Yale Committee about the Brexit. Where is uh, my talk? Huh? Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I remember this date the 23rd of June 2016 very well. That time I was still uh, current chair of the SOE YO committee and I had just arrived in Oviedo for that year's very successful EMYO uh, meeting. I had just uh, went to the, to, the, to the polling station back in London before I caught my flight to give my, uh, to, 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 to vote in, in that uh, Brexit um, referendum that we had in 2016. And I remember on that day, arriving in Oviedo, the, the, the lovely feelings, the positive, the hopeful feelings that I, I, I had seeing so many young, enthusiastic, gifted ophthalmologists from so many diverse countries in Europe brought together in the same place due to a common share of values and thanks to the privilege they have of the, free move, uh, the freedom of movement within European states. Unfortunately, uh, when I got up in the morning, uh, I woke up to this horrible result, the result of the Brexit referendum. And the three years that ensued has led both to my country and everywhere else in Europe a lot to a lot of chaos and uncertainty. And still, till this very day, we have no idea of what our future relationship with the European Union is going to be. And it all is going to rest on whether there's going to be a deal or no deal. So current, uh, we all know that uh, the, European, the United Kingdom is a very popular choice among European trainees to come over and get training experience um, uh, in, in ophthalmology. And up to this date, achieving this very important certificate, which is the GMC certificate, the General Medical Council certificate, 
came automatically. It was a privilege of all um, European uh, ophthalmology trainees who, after completion of their um, residency program within their European state, got automatically registered onto the British um, uh, General Medical Council. This will hopefully stay on up until the date of, whether, of, of, of when Brexit, Brexit is, if it is ever going to happen. And hopefully even after uh, in the transition period that, uh, that will ensue. However, following that, we have no idea what will be, uh, will, 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 will be the, f the, 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 the means of trying to achieve, the way, the route of trying to achieve this, uh, uh, this registration. I remember two years ago in the SOE meeting uh, we had in Barcelona, we had given a similar talk and we said, we have absolutely no clue what's going to happen. And here I am again, three, two <laughs> years later, saying the same thing. However, I think we need to be realistic about this. And I think the reality is going to be that after uh, Brexit, anyone wishing to apply for a residency, uh, for a training opportunity within the Uni United Kingdom, will have to do so as a third country, um, like what happens to all the other um, ophthalmology trainees that who are outside uh, the countries of the European Union. I, and what this essentially would mean is that you need to do much more advanced plan planning. At the moment, you guys have the privilege and the luck to be able to decide tomorrow that you want to go do a training opportunity, apply online, and go for it within a short period of time. That, unfortunately, will change. And I think I can really relate to this, because I am originally uh, from a little island called Malta. I don't know if um, uh, some of you know where that is. Uh, it's one of the smallest European states in Europe. And when I had applied to come to the United Kingdom in order to pursue a training uh, program here in the UK, Malta was not yet part of the European Union. So I, will, I can share with you my experiences of what I had to do back then, being outside the European Union, and which probably will be the case after Brexit. So the first thing, as I said, you need much more advanced planning. And any successful person knows that in order to succeed, you have to have a goal in mind. And you need to, in order to achieve this goal, you need to go through a period of self-reflection and ask yourself, what do I really want out of a training opportunity outside of my country, in this case, in the United Kingdom? Am I satisfied with the residency training that I'm achieving within my country? Or perhaps I'm not in some areas, for example, cataract surgery, or for example, emergency surgery. In this case, there are several training opportunities that one could have by, for example, applying for a short period of time, a six-month post that are so readily available in the United Kingdom um, to fill up for, um, for, for example, maternity or sickness leave that can exist within a, a training program. So these are opportunities that someone who, in, in, who an, whose answer in the first question is could, uh, could, could opt to have. If, on the other hand, you are very satisfied with the training you achieved as a resident within your own country, but would like to refine and further develop skills in a particular field of ophthalmology, then perhaps a fellowship is the right path for you. And you could apply for a glaucoma, vitroretinal uh, fellowship, etc. However, I think the most important question to answer is the third one that many of you now will have to ask at a much earlier stage. And that is, would I like to return back to my European country at the end of this period of training, or would I prefer to pursue a career within the United Kingdom? Because if that is the answer, if genuinely I really think that I would like to pursue a training, a, a, a career within the United Kingdom, then the answer for you is to probably uh, start from scratch and do a full residency program within the United Kingdom. That would put you in a much better position to have a permanent position later on as a consultant. So for example, I did that. You know, I started from scratch applying for a residency training program, which at the moment is seven years. 
followed by several fellowships, and then at the end of it, it is, you are much better positioned to achieve a consultant position. Lots of, lots of people come in, do lots of fellow, fellowships, for, for example, because they think it's a waste of time to go back and start a residency training program, but then now they will find it will be much more difficult to get a, 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 a you can do five fellowships, but then you still need to do a conversion course, because at the moment, um, uh, you need to be, in a, uh, after Brexit, you will need to have a training position, that, uh, a, a residency that has been within the uni United Kingdom. So the, 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 the second step, after you've decided what you really want, is to obviously look for where the jobs in the United Kingdom are. And the United Kingdom are very specific. The vast majority of jobs are found on this website called NHS Jobs. Some of them are also found in websites like BMJ Careers. And there is also another website which is relatively unknown, but does advertise quite a few opportunities, and this is called idocs.co.uk. So, once you've decided that you want a position and which position, then you need to obviously think of how you're gonna get this GMC registration, which is in order so that you have a license to practice in the UK. And after Brexit, the most, the greatest probability is that you will need to go through either of these three routes. So either you sit for the Bla PLAB examination, which is the Professional Language and Linguistic Board of the United Kingdom, which basically is a validation of your medical school certificate back home in your own country. So you will have to sit for a, an MC, two, a, a long MCQ examination, and if you pass that, you move on to clinical stations and clinical scenario, which, are, which is, will be held in the United Kingdom. So that's a, something to keep in mind. It also will incur an additional cost. These exams are expensive and will require you coming to the United Kingdom in order to do this exam. So this is obviously uh, for those people who would like to, do, to start from scratch and do a training program from the beginning here in the United Kingdom, there in the United Kingdom. Another, for all those of you who think and are feeling a bit more brave and perhaps more money to spend because this is much more of a, an expensive option, is rather than, uh, than sitting for a examination, they, they, they sit for the FRCS ophthalmology of Glasgow. This is the only ophthalmic board in the United Kingdom that, can, that one can do without being within a training prog program in the United Kingdom. It is at the moment held in several centers abroad. It's, there are three... Uh, components to it. There's the part one component, which is basic science and knowledge. There's a refraction certificate. And there's a third part, which is a, which is a clinical station. And again, as I said, they can be done several, several stations, not in Europe at the moment. Probably after Brexit, they will expand to other European countries, uh, to European countries in order to be able to sit for the exam. This is quite a costly exercise, and the pass rate would be quite low. Okay, so we're we're talking about 40% pass rate here. And once you pass that examination, you can then apply for GMC registration. The third option for registration would be the medical training initiative. So what is this? This is basically a dual sponsorship scheme whereby your university will make an arrangement with the Royal College of Ophthalmologists in London and sponsor you in order that you will get registration for a targeted period of training, after which you will be expected to return back to your country, and this, will not, this period of training will not give you um, a completion of, 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 of a certificate of completion of training within the United Kingdom. So basically, if you say you want to just gain skills in glaucoma surgery or vitrectomy surgery, you come here with a clear target in mind under the sponsorship of the Royal College of Ophthalmology, who sponsor your GMC registration. They give you also a tier five visa if, if that happens. However, as things stand at the moment, there is a priority list. And the priority list is for lower middle income countries. And, or, and, or, and these, and unfortunately, none of the, the list is, is of any European countries. Okay, so unless this changes, uh, it pay, probably will not be a viable option uh, for uh, European trainees. But uh, hopefully they will understand that after Brexit we will need much more of, uh, of, uh, of people from Europe and hopefully they will facilitate this initiative. So once you, you get one of the, those three um, um, 
uh, three routes, pass through one of three routes, you then have to apply for GMC registration. And this is very simple. What you need to do is email the GMC with a copy of your passport, a copy of your primary medical qualification. You need a certificate of good standing from a relevant medical authority. So you go to your university and they give you a certificate of good standing. And this is something extremely important, which you still have to do now, whether, or whether we leave the European Union or not. And that is you have to show evidence of knowledge of the English language. You will have to do the YELTS examination and you will need to get a score of at least seven in each of the four areas tested, which are speaking, listening, reading, and writing, and an overall score of at least 7.5. But there is also another option. A YELTS apparently is quite tricky, particularly where, uh, those, uh, for those people who, who's, where English is not their first language. And there is another option that's on the table, and very few people know about it, and that's called the Occupational English Test, the OET where you just need a grade of B in each testing area of medicine uh, version of the test, and apparently it's much simpler to get. You also, in your email, need to send a, your, a copy of your postgraduate qualification certificate or the certificate of the PLAB examination, and you also need references for any periods of non-medical work completed within the last five years or any periods of medical work for which you did not hold registration within the last five years and if obviously they're not in English, you will need translation. Once the GMC received these email, this email, you should be approved within three months. Uh, sorry, you should be approved immediately, and then you have three months to attend in person at a GMC office in either London or Manchester. And I'm saying that is because I'm trying to remind you that there's lots of cost involved. You will need to travel to the United Kingdom, stay in hotels, etc., in order to go to the GMC office and get an identity check. And this you will have to do on a tourist visa. Presumably there will be some visa after Brexit for Europeans visiting the UK and vice versa. Once you have this, uh, this uh, GMC certificate, you are then in a position to apply for the job that you have uh, your mind on. Very few people will interview, will agree to, very few centres will agree to interview candidates if at least there is not any potential of GMC registration. For example, you've got a, a Yale certificate or the FRC of the certificate. Now, all this, um, you, you, oh, during this process, once you have the GMC certificate and are applying for the job, and if you get the job, you will get a work permit. And the work permit, sadly, unlike what it used to be before, is a tier two permit, which basically means that you are occupying a job that uh, the United Kingdom was not able to fill in with its own nationals or its own trainees. So, uh, whereas, unfortunately, at the moment, we enjoy uh, equal opportunities for all United States in Europe, whether U UK people come to, to, the, to Europe and vice versa. After Brexit, it is likely that that will be, lo will be lost. And also, to be able to get a work permit, it will be an expensive exercise. At the moment, just applying for this work permit is 500 pounds, so again, another cost. However, all right, you, you need to keep in mind that the NHS, where you will be doing your training attachment, is very welcoming and very diverse. Currently, the nationals of other EU countries make up 9.7% of doctors in all England hospitals and community health services. So for every 1,000 NHS staff there is in England, 873 are British, whereas 56 are from other European Union countries. And I do remind you that there are 1.2 million workers in the, in, in, in the NHS, okay, 9.7 of that is uh, doctors, sorry, um, workers, sorry, and 9.7 of that are doctors from the United uh, from European Union. It is extremely important, in my opinion, well and good you get a job, but it's very important to familiarize yourself to, to, to the new systems that uh, you will have to, uh, you will have to, you will encounter in your new training attachment. Okay, if you really want to maintain and keep that GMC registration. Although the United Kingdom is very welcoming, it, it is, uh, it, there are different systems, you will be used to different things in your own country, and it's very important to, uh, to induce yourself and, uh, um, uh, and learn of how things are done differently. And there are online, um, online re training that you could do, such as this website. Um, it's an e-learning module to introduce internationally qualified doctors who are new to the UK cl uh, clinical practice to their nat to national, ethical, social, legal, and professional aspects. 
And also, it would be very important and very wise of you that before a clinic, uh, before coming for a training um, opportunity in the United Kingdom, you perhaps do an observership to see, well, first of all, whether this is for you, and also to familiarize yourself with the new culture, et cetera, that you will be, um, uh, you will be exposed to. And perhaps you could attach it to the time when you come uh, to, uh, to, to, to get uh, confirmation from GMC of your identity in that period of time. So uh, I hope you find this useful, and I hope that the future will keep UK within the stars of the European Union, that even despite of any political and uh, dramas that will, will go on, okay, we will still be united and, our, and share our values and share our training opportunities, albeit it might be more difficult and require a bit more commitment from you guys and also uh, more planning and cost. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you, and then I will introduce my co-chair, Miguel Gonzalez Andres from Spain, who will talk about a survey, benchmarking the European residency program. So it's a pleasure to be here today, uh, presenting the work that we are carrying out to benchmark uh, European residency programs in order to harmonize and enhance ophthalmology training in Europe. Uh, there are no financial or conflict of interest. And I would like to thank, um, for sure, the whole uh, USA committee, but especially these three people, Marie Louise, Simon, you all know them, and specifically Roberto, Roberto is in a subcommittee, and uh, Roberto and I, we've been spending so many hours in this project. Uh, it came from, um, from the beginning in the SOI committee, in the IO committee, we thought that we need to inform that one of the main issues regarding the disparities in Europe, regarding the, the ophthalmology training, was part of the, we need to inform. And we started a newsletter, a database to gather all the fellowship in, in Europe, but suddenly we realized that that amalgam that we have in Europe, those disparities, are blocking part of that, those opportunities. So we decided to describe, to benchmark those disparities in order to fight for against those. So we started this residency training survey using Google, the Google platform. Every single resident can respond to that, and also those that are in the last two years, so after two years per residency program. We got 135 respondents from different countries. Uh, as you can see, Denmark, France, Spain are on the top of the list, and then we have several countries. Uh, you can see there are Netherlands, uh, Austria, Switzerland, no respondents at all. So please uh, feel free to, to join to this project, collaborate, and, and share. Um, of those respondents, uh, more than 65% were residents. Uh, they were from uh, year one to year five. And then we have uh, around 10% of the respondents that were consultants, 11% they were fellows, and then of the specialists, ophthalmology specialists, 14%. We wanted to know the, the length, the total length of the residency programs. In general, as you can see in that graph, I hear this. It goes from four to five years. Uh, there are uh, extreme cases like Ireland and UK where it's between seven to eight years. And then there are, in the other poll, we have, for example, Belarus or uh, Ukraine, which is where are less than three years. We wanted to know also regarding and uh, focusing in training program. So we asked them if there's an official training program that it's covering all the national uh, training. And we found that 75% respond yes. However, those that responded no, we realized that they indeed didn't know that there was a national program. So when we check and we try to validate those data, we found that, uh, that when we found some inconsistency, uh, more than 90% of the respondents, they have a national program. Um, and then if you jump to a regional training program, there are very few, just close to 20%, that they have, apart from the national program, a regional or a local program. We also focus on, on calls. Uh, in, on average, uh, residents are performing three to four on calls uh, days uh, per month. And if you check the supervision at the beginning of the residency, most of them are supervised, 
direct supervision, and then in the middle and in the end of the residency, the, this is an indirect supervision. And surprisingly, there's a six to seven percent of the people that they didn't perform any on-call during the whole residency. And this is what it means. Um, we jump to hours. How many hours per week people are working now? Um, most of them, there's an average of 40 per week, 40 hours per week, with a range between 30 to 50. And for sure, as you know, we spend so many hours out of our contract, and we try to, to inform about that. And around, there's an average of eight hours per week that we are working in general of all those respondents. And it's relatively, I mean, sometimes as, as usual. Then jumping to the salary huge disparities and this is part of the reason because I think I'm quitting and jumping to Denmark, Norway or Germany more than 5,000 per month um, so nice to go back to residency I would say um, then you have the other extreme countries that receive less than 500 dollars uh, sorry euros per month we want also to know about fellowships and more than 50% of the respondents, they want to perform a fellowship. But if you check, 50% of them responding, responded that there are no fellowships available in those countries, in their countries. And if you check if there's any mandatory uh, in terms of you need to perform a fellowship in order to be a consultant, there's only 11% of respondents saying yes. And if you check the data, there's only one country that is asking an, as a mandatory uh, need to have a fellowship in order to be a consultant, and they don't have fellowships that they are offering to those residents, and it's Ireland. We need to validate all the data with the National uh, Society, uh, but this is what we have right now, the moment. Then we asked about uh, boards, and more than 50% of the people, they have to complete the national exam in order uh, to be ophthalmologist. At uh, 50%, the European Board of Ophthalmology, and 2%, the ICO. Um, surprisingly, there are 25% of the respondents that, that responded that there's no need to perform any uh, exam in order to, to get the validation to be ophthalmologist. We wanted to know also about satisfaction. So we asked them about residency length, working hours, clinical competencies, and surgical competencies. As you can see here, most of the people are very or completely satisfied in terms of residency length, working hours, and clinical competencies. But here, you have surgical competencies. Almost 50% of the respondents, they responded not at all satisfied. So we wanted to understand what was happening here. And we analyzed the graph you have here, and surprisingly, there are several countries that the 100% of people responding from those countries, they were not at all satisfied in terms of surgical competencies. Armenia, Belarus, Belgium, Sonia, Germany, Ireland, Poland, Romania, Russia. And if you check, they were performing le around zero or less than 50 FICOs uh, in the whole residency. Then we wanted to see the other extreme. So we checked the countries and the respondents from these two bars, completely satisfied and very satisfied. France, Greece, Israel, Portugal, Spain, and UK. Despite of some people that were not at all satisfied, maybe people with um, uh, huge requirements, uh, but most of them, all the people here, perform more than 100 FACOs after finishing the residency. We went further, and we wanted to understand what was happening in other uh, surgical procedures. And these are the percentage of respondents that did not perform a specific surgical procedure. So half of the respondent, close to half, uh, they didn't, uh, they didn't perform a fi FACO, repair eyelid uh, laceration, or trigeminal excision, and close to 90, 90%, 90 they didn't perform glaucoma or retinal surgery. If you ask them what is the expected number of cataract surgeries to perform in the residency, this is what they expect. So most of the people are expecting to perform 
50 to 200 cataract surgeries in the residency. And if you go farther and you ask in terms of agreement, if they agree uh, to create an equal training program for all European residents in order to control and address this issue in terms of disparities, mainly in the surgical competencies, most of them agree or completely agree about that. And if you jump to the, uh, the need of an exam in order to be eligible to practice, also most of the people agree or completely agree to have an exam like the EVO or the ICO. And after that, I want to invite uh, Marie Louise uh, in order to explain and get into the equal program or the minimum curriculum that she's been working. Thank you. Thank you, Miguel. Um, the thing was that after this, uh, we started out this survey, we needed to discuss what to do with it. And um, I actually totally agree with Christina that all the dry laps and wet laps are a tremendous opportunity that our generations have got. But it needs to be followed, it needs to be included in a plan. For example, in my country, we don't have much surgical training, but I trained 200 hours on the IC simulator. But I didn't were allowed to do any practice on FACO afterwards. And then it's just a waste of time, in my opinion. I mean, I've spent so many nights sitting there doing uh, IC simulation. I woke up in the middle of the night with the sound, do not touch the lens. Uh, so, <laughs> I mean, it needs to lead to something. And the thing people are screaming at, and I know the more adults in this room think that we're screaming too much sometimes, but the thing is we, we want to do surgery. But the thing that we started out discussing within our committee, and this is definitely the work of the whole Yo committee and Clara Kringley, um, were to discuss what are we training to become? Because there are some differences across Europe, what we're actually training to become. And I am aware that our countries where ophthalmologists prescribe glasses. And that's quite far from doing DMEC. Uh, so, so we need to find a balance. So are we training to become comprehensive surgeon, to become able to get a fellowship? Because that's another part of this story, that if you want to achieve a fellowship, the surgical competences you need to document are quite extensive and most can't fulfill these requirements. Or are we actually training within our residency program to become a subspecialist? Because that's what they do in Ireland. So that's also a, a difference. And then we, after a quite long discussion, ended up saying we are training to become general comprehensive ophthalmologist who can take care of the majority of patients with all types of eye diseases who is met in the general population. The subspecialist we regard as people who have trained more and who can take care of more rare diseases, complicated cases, do things surgically that only a minority of the general ophthalmologist can do in a given area. And that actually goes very well hand in hand with the EBO, who is testing broadly in all 12 subspecialities the general ophthalmologist need. And you can follow it with a subspecialty exam. Then we need to look into what are, what are we training? Are we training full competence? Which means that you can complete all steps without supervision. You are able to do this surgery independently. Or are we the primary surgeon where we are doing all steps, maybe once in a while, building up, but under appropriate faculty supervision? Someone else in the room, not at another hallway, but someone in the room or just outside the door backing you up. Or are we assisting or even less important, observing? So we need to be aware of these steps in it. And then we needed to look for inspiration. And I am in the ICO accreditation committee. Uh, so I'm quite aware of the residency curriculum for ICO. And they have built their curriculum on three years of training. 
which goes very well hand in hand with that three exams you can take to complete the ICO exams. Uh, this is a wonderful curriculum. Genius people have written it. I've not been part of that. Uh, but it's too comprehensive to use in Europe. In this program, you do complicated trabeculectomies. You do cross-linking, you do cornea transplantation, you even do DMEC. And you do complicated squint and vitreretinal surgery in the retinal, retina, residency curriculum. That is uh, too good to be true. Um, then we looked for UK, Royal College of Ophthalmologists, and they go with minimum numbers. And uh, I actually like the idea about minimum numbers because even you can say maybe 350 is a bit low, but in UK they train surgeons, and they're quite specific that they train of an an ophthalmologist in England is a surgeon. If you don't need surgery, you go for the optometrist and get your glasses. Uh, but I like minimum numbers because it gives a backdoor for people who thought they would, would be good in surgical things. But actually, they didn't have the fine tune. They, they, weren't, they weren't really suited for it, or they felt uncomfortable. They didn't like using a microscope. They have a backdoor, still becoming an ophthalmologist, and we need these people as well. But they do FACO. And, but if you look into the numbers, actually, that's mainly what they do. They do a little bit of laser, they do ocoplastic, uh, not ptosis. Um, glaucoma is mainly laser in UK. Uh, they assist in corneal transplant, they assist in ptosis, uh, they assist in vitreoretinal surgery. Um, then we looked at the US numbers, and they go with minimum numbers as well. The average numbers of procedures is much higher, but they have the same system with minimum numbers. And again, they do FACO, they do laser surgery. A means that you are assisting. So S is a surgeon, primary surgeon, not full competence, but you're the primary surgeon, assisting. And they assist in a lot of things as well. And it, there is uh, quite, quite a few ocoplastics. Uh, but for the rest, you are mainly assisting. You have some strepismologists and you have the globe trauma, and that's mainly because you have places where people are, should be able to handle a globe rupture for emergency departments. Then we went through a huge discussion about what are the criteria for selecting pr procedures if we're going for a minimum curriculum. And we do have set patient safety issue. Is it safe to train vitreoretinal retinal surgery? Definitely not. <laughs> that could definitely be a patient safety issue. Then we also need to look at the burden of the disease, the number of procedures per year per million inhabitants. Diabetic, chelation, entropion, uh, small eyelid tumors, cataract, AMD, big, big, huge diseases for entire populations. And then we'll also look a little bit into skill transfer because that's the reason why most programs include external surgery. It's safe, you can't blind the patient. It's easy for uh, supervisors to save you in the situation. And there is a skilled transfer towards more complicated surgery. And then we also need to look at the competence versus numbers, because we know from the literature that you need at least 250 FACOs to become competent. You don't need 250 collations to do that. And you don't definitely know, does, does not need 250 YAC membranectomies to become a superior <laughs> membranectomy. Uh, member of the staff. Uh, actually, it's a problem in many European countries that we have too many injections. It's a, it's a good task if you diminish the numbers of in injections for some of the residents. If you get below 1,000, you're pretty good. <laughs> um, so this is the suggestion. It's not a wishing list. It's, it's a suggestion for discussion and from the view that we think that these procedures we're going to list is for all, that they should have a ch fair chance to get this really basic introduction. And then lasers. Lasers are good to teach because you have a side scope, you can have someone sitting next to you instructing you what you're doing, what you're looking at, where you should put your focus. 
Uh, and, and we have lots of phaco. You need to be able to do a capsulectomy. You need to treat tears, breaks, and holes in the retina, treat diabetic retinopathy. But macular grit, well, anti VHGF have solved that problem. It's not really safe to train anymore. We don't have that many. That's a specialist task. So this task has actually moved from general to more specific. Injections, uh, it's useful to be able to put in a retrobulb anesthesia. Uh, Intervigil, it goes without saying. <laughs> uh, anterior segment, corneal, foreign, body removal. We all need to know that. We need to have exposure for that. We need to, to be able to remove corneal sutures, simple thorygium as primary with someone besides us not complicated, not anteric chamber puncture. One thing that's always in these curriculum is corneal biopsies. Who does that? But it's, <laughs> it's still there. Um, so that's also a rare thing. Um, and then we reach the, the FACO thing. And we have set 50, uh, which is actually a very low number, but we think that's the reasonable number to reach as a European minimum number. No complicated, no DMEC. Um, the external really put in a lot of things. Small shaving of tumors, shaving of papillomas, epilation of lashes, chelation to treat a ductocystitis. Um, more uh, complex com procedures where you have faculty supervision standing behind you. And I don't think it needs to be numbers, how many entropion versus ectropion you do. It's all a lateral strip in the end. Um, punctual occlusion. Ptosis is for subspecialization, in our opinion. And the same go for removal eyes. Botox is also subspecialization. Um, and we have put in strap because we think that it has a, a place uh, in skill transfer and it's useful, especially for treating globe traumas. You need to be able to release the muscle and suture the globe. You need to be, have some training in working in that area, but rest is actually mostly as assistant. You need to see it. You need to see these things to know what you're referring your patient to, but also to know what to be aware of and especially how to treat them when they return. Um, this is numbers from uh, the study Miguel just uh, said, and it's about faker numbers because that's always the discussion. Uh, one of the very positive things in the survey was actually that people are quite good uh, self-reflecting about the numbers they actually perform versus the required number they actually feel they should have had to feel surgically independent. And none of these respondents in this survey have read the literature. I don't think they've got into the numbers, but actually they stayed around 250 to 500 to become an independent cataract surgeon. Um, so it is, um, there is a plateau around 250 and, and we know that it's the first 50 cataracts who's actually the most dangerous. So that's why you need someone with you. And that's also why we suggest fakers not as as independent, fully competent, but more that you have someone with you in the room. Uh, and if you do that with a faculty supervision, the complication rate is quite low. Uh, if you do it alone as a fully competent primary surgeon, the adverse event rate is around 0.8 going from 50 to 250, and it halves every time you raise until 0 0.1 at around 1,000. So in conclusion, we are training to become general ophthalmologists within our residencies, and we think that all residents should be able to take care of the majorities of cases, because we are not all heading for university departments. Most residents in Europe, they will go for a local hospital, they will go in private practice, and they should be able to take care of the main population diseases. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much, Marie-Louise. Thank you, Miguel, for having me. Um, so I was told 
that I am a globetrotter. And I really like that definition because it's a person who travels widely, and that's exactly how I think myself. So if you ask me my opinion, I really think that the world is your oyster. You have how many countries in the world? You have that many opportunities to learn something if you go abroad. And there are actually many reasons to go abroad to have an experience as an ophthalmologist. Medical reasons, because you will be able to experience how a laboratory, a clinic, or a hospital works, to see rare diseases and diverse population in different places, to learn how to operate new technology, and obviously to make a change, because after all, that's the beauty of medicine, new challenges. So international collaborations are always really good because I feel that if you establish a relationship with another laboratory, multi-center standards deliver bigger samples and therefore the results are far more accurate. They can change practices and obviously they give you the opportunity to work with ophthalmology opinion leaders from all over the world. For cultural reasons, to learn new languages, I speak five. So I guess that's a very good skill if you don't want to do ophthalmology but you want to have another career in case it doesn't work to experience new habits, <laughs> to meet new people, civilizations, cities, to learn history, to taste food, and generally to have life experiences. And obviously for personal reasons, you can't stand your mom anymore and you need to live for a while. You need to have a little bit of fun, you need some personal growth, and obviously, who knows, meet the man, woman of your dreams. So, should you do a research fellowship? Why would you do research? What is research to begin with? It's an investigation to a subject in order to discover new information or new facts, or reach a new understanding, or simply to correct information. In other words, you want to do research because you're curious, because you're ambitious, because you're excited, and because research is a, is a very creative process, because you want to make a change, or because you're not a very morning person. So when I was doing research, I used to um, not say, wake up at 6 o'clock, as I do now that I'm a surgeon, but I would leave the hospital last. Clinical fellowships. Why would you do a clinical fellowship? Because in your country, you don't have the opportunity to get a hands-on experience, and that has been very thoroughly analyzed now. Because the experience you had was not enough to give you confidence to work or operate independently. Because you want the opportunity to subspecialize into something that you have decided to do, or you're addicted to training, which is probably my problem as well. So let me tell you a little bit about my journey. So I started at the University of Crete. I'm Greek originally. So after I finished my medical school, I spent four years having my first taste in ophthalmology close to my mentor who is Professor Pelikaris. And I did my refractive surgery fellowship there, I did my PhD, I saw a lot of complex cases and it was my first exposure to research. I had my first presentation there, I published and obviously Professor Pelikaris, the thing that he, um, the thing that I learned from him was that I had to think outside of the box in order to get a solution to a question and second of all how to treat my patients which is ex extremely important. So that was my first paper. I wrote it. It took me about a week. Then Professor Kimionis took it and changed it completely. But it turned out, turned out to be a complication at the end, a publication at the end of the day, which was great for me. And then there are a few papers that I feel very proud of. Um, so that was m what I gained from having a research fellowship there. So then I decided to take a taste of the United States. So I decided uh, to have a very brief observership at the Massa Air Infirmary. Um, for which, if you want to observe, you don't actually need a visa, you can go with your ESTA there, and obviously after you get in touch with them. And I took a taste of the USA training system, which is very, very good, and you've learned the details of that as well and how it's improving. So what's the main problem with going to the US for training? Um, you probably need to pass the US MLEs before you do that if you want to have a hands-on fellowship. You have to have a working visa, it's a J-1 visa, or a note one visa, in order to get it, you'd need at least six months of planning in advance, and you have to be prepared for huge bureaucracy issues before you do that. But once that's been solved, you can take two roads again. You can do research, or you can do a clinical fellowship. Usually, research is easier, because it's, um, it's easier to get, and um, there's no surgical exposure, though. It's, n it's a non-hands-on fellowship. There are still limitations. So after you finish the fellowship, you probably need to return back home. Um, but also you have to pay for yourself, which is another issue. Um, and I'll tell you about my um, I'll tell you about my struggles when I went to Bascom Palmer a little bit later on. 
But in any case, sky's the limit when you do research in the United States. Um, where to go? Possibly a university-based institution. And then the city, you have many options to go to. For how long? Maybe not more than a year if you want to do a research fellowship, and depending on what you're looking for. Um, these are some suggestions, but obviously they're not the only ones. There are many, many places that you can go to and many different things that you can learn and experience. Clinical fellowship. So if you are not a resident, if you haven't done your training in the United States, that's very difficult. Um, you need to go through the MLEs. You probably need to go through the whole training system in order to get a fellowship, and then you're not sure where you're going to end up to. There is the concept of the international fellow, which works in some states, but not all of them, in which you get a provisional license only for the state that you work in, for example, Florida, where I was, or um, California, where you can work for a year there. You can be hands-on. You are a true fellow. You do whatever the other um, uh, fellows do, but then you have to return back home. And obviously, after you have um, um, you know, made yourself better in your craft, to whatever learn, just go and implement in your country. And it's really worth it. So that was my experience. Um, that was Miami. So I stayed there for a year. To me, it was a once in a lifetime experience. I had the opportunity to see and work one of the best surgeons in the world and I saw them operate and that was something. You know what, don't, don't ask to made observing. Observing helps a lot. I know that hands-on is much better, but seeing how things work sometimes and how the mentality is different actually can, can help you a lot. And do innovative research. So when I, um, I was doing research at the same time, so when I arrived in the United States, I uh, did my Airbnb approvals for the studies that I had good ideas I thought of. It took about six months, so halfway down my fellowship, for them to get approved. And then most of my studies are being finished by other people and not by myself, because I had to go. And the one that I'm most proud of is actually the iMetrics uh, system, which is a system that we worked with the University of Miami with the computer science department. We're actually doing something like a topography, but for the eyelids. So we're doing an oculoplastics topography, which we have to file the patent on, and it's still ongoing. UK fellowships. So then I decided that the United States were a little bit far, so I migrated back to Europe. Well, still Europe, which is the UK. So I did my first fellowship in Leeds up north, and I'm currently in London, where I will be staying for a little bit longer. I do feel that the UK experience is amazing. It's one of the world's largest healthcare care systems. The population is indeed diverse, multicultural, and it has a wide range of health needs. You will definitely become a surgeon, as Marie-Louise pointed out, and you'll have the opportunity to experience living and working in the UK, minus the weather, if you come from the Mediterranean. And it still is open access to EU citizens. It's definitely a good experience. It's a long experience. As you know, the training program is large. But I think that it's a very well thought, and it helps a lot, and it will help you advance. So what's my next stop? I think we can talk about it in Prague in 2021 if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> I have something in mind. So other international opportunities, you can go to India. Uh, you can go to Australia and New Zealand for your fellowships. Um, if you still want to do research or a clinical fellowship or an observatory abroad, I know that the SOEOs can help. They're being very helpful. They have the Europe Fellowship Database. They can give you scholarship grants. So get on the website, see the EO page, and try to see how we can help you to do that. As said before, the world is our oyster. International experiences make you a better doctor, help you form friendships for life, are very innovative, and can make a change in ophthalmology. So my advice to you before you settle in your practice is definitely to pursue an experience abroad. And even though not how much you travel, you, you know, there's no place like, like home, these are a few pictures from my country, Greece. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, we all overseed our time. <laughs> we actually collective did that. Um, but we have four minutes left, if uh, anyone has questions. I'm sure we will all be here, yeah? And yeah, I think the, there is one over there. Just one to you. Um, a lot has been said about UK trainee, training, producing surgeons. 
That is not entirely correct. Uh, in the UK, there are two pathways that one could go through. There is the, of the surgical pathway, which will definitely give you, uh, um, uh, in the end, you will become a, a fully competent independent surgery. But now, more and more medical pathways are, 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 are arising, such as if you want to do medical retina, for example, or uveitis. And I think the most important thing, for what you, for taking on to what you have said, Marie Louise, in your talk, is that the, the trainees should have proper pathways in their own country. Rather than having their time wasted being thrown into a, a residency program where there's no structure, no organization, and they don't know where they're going, you know, I do agree that perhaps surgery is not for everyone, particularly in, in, in European states, okay, where um, uh, very few people do the surgery, but there should be clear pathways for those wishing to embark on the most challenging and more difficult surgical pathway, and there should be also a pathway for those embarking into a medical, um, a medical but, but future. But you're really right, because one of the most basic things that we also have been working with is rotation system to yeah. ensure fair share of all subspecialities. I think and that's no. really, uh, when you live in a system yeah. where we do have that, you don't think that much about it, but it's really an issue. If you have a residency where you do AMD injections and you do pre-operative uh, examination for cataract most of the time, I ah, think it's you, you, you miss something. Exactly. I think <laughs> countries in the European Union should really look at, at uh, uh, do a lot of forward planning and say, listen, we need X percentage of surgeons, we need X percentage of ophthalmologists, you know, and f gather from that information, then move on to create uh, proper, uh, proper training programs that will reflect this need. I'm uh, Marco Havlina. I was, um, let's say, resident in many years ago in Slovenia, which was Yugoslavia at that time, and was third year resident when I came to UK to do my PhD and parts of fellowships. And I really found out that my ophthalmic language was totally different as it was in UK. Now, it's no longer the case. It's changed a lot with all these programs that has changed. So all of you young ones actually do learn similar, you know, ophthalmology, you speak the same language. However, Miguel, your survey is Fantastic, it's a great work, congratulations for that. I think it's very disturbing to see these differences because uh, it is not a question about whether or not you should be allowed or uh, uh, you know, taught surgery. It is about what is our health system going to be in European Union. Okay, we have diverse systems, every country has diverse system, but we have one directive which says that all the European Union citizens should be actually entitled to similar health care, which means our teaching systems should be harmonized. And this, of course, such service open a big question, really. And Europe uh, and UMS, which runs this, and uh, Christina, who is the president of PBO, knows that, is that um, ETRs are sort of European training requirements, which are now being rebuilt for every subspecialty or any, any of every specialty, and perhaps ophthalmology would need to do something about surgery as well. It's not about right to do surgery, it's about the healthcare system. And this is something that we should be really uh, worried about, and thank you, Miguel, for bringing this up. And um, just wanted to comment on Marie-Louise. It's something that we discussed within the education, uh, SOE Education Committee, which I'm actually president of, and uh, I said, you know, you young ones, you complain all the time, you know, you have to do surgery and so on, so on. I said, okay, sit down and tell us, the elder ones, what do you really want and what do you think is realistic? And they brought up this suggestion, which I think is quite realistic and it's probably doable, and it's probably you know worth serious consideration. And thank you for doing that, Marie Louise, and also thank you for all your services you've done with SOE YO program. And Miguel, good luck for the next <laughs> mandate. I, I just want to make a short comment on actually Miguel's study. If you look into the numbers, because he's going to publish that sometime, it's a fun fact 
for, for the more senior people in this room, look at how many of the residents who's actually answering worsely than the official status is. So the official is that they have four years of training, but the resident marks that they only have two, or they only have three, or they are not even training anything. So there is a, a gap between the official status and what people actually do. Then we actually have a question from someone on our side. Hi. Um, Hi. My name is Ksenia Fedoriak. I'm a fifth year student from Poland. And this, yes. This is our Hi. favorite. Yeah. <laughs> I came again with my questions. I'm actually here presenting the topic of medical students' awareness of binocularity and specialization choice. And I think this would fit a lot because the main conclusion of my work was that there should be standards developed and implemented in everywhere uh, concerning the fact that does the student has the adequate eye function to choose a particular specialty? Because you're not gonna be, yes, you can develop it by your skills, but it's not fun to figure out on your first year of residence that you're going to be a neurosurgeon and you don't see the difference between the vessels. So what is your opinion about this? Would there be standards for all of the types in your countries, for example, the same as in UK, the same in Greece, anywhere in Spain? Are there standards for visual assessment for the students who want to do the surgical ophthalmology? Will they be checked? Can they do it? I, I think unofficially, many places they do test people. They, they, they don't test them for residency. And I don't think that would be e ethically uh, good to do so. But, uh, and some, but, but depth perception is definitely a thing if you're going to be vitreretinal. Um, and they do, they do test people at my institution. Uh, and, and uh, if you, you pay attention and you want to do microscopic uh, thing, you, you need to be tested. And uh, they, they senior, they ask, not really so uncovered sometimes. Oh, have you ever been squinting? I can see you wear glasses. <coughs> so I was put through a quite heavily examination. Uh, so they do test, but I, I would say to put in uh, blocks where you could say, well, your biocular vision is below 120 degrees and therefore you can't uh, this and that or you have a cylinder be above three. Uh, I don't think that is a good idea. I'm not forcing to develop a standard that would say yes you can or no you can't. It's more for informational purpose for the student himself yeah. that they may be some points in your life when they will be start worrying. You can say that, that many places, I, I can only answer for Denmark, but in Denmark, when you are having ear, nose, and throat, uh, you te they test your ears. <laughs> and when we have ophthalmology, <laughs> we take, check each other's eyes. Mm -hmm. And uh, those who can't see or can't hear, <laughs> they are told in a very <laughs> nice way that they should be aware which career path they are choosing. Yeah. So in Spain, we don't have any kind of evaluation for that. So, uh, and I know some people that after choosing uh, ophthalmology, then they have some some if issues like that. Um, it's true that ethically, uh, it could be controversial. Uh, so it's really hard to implement those kind of uh, strategies. Uh, but it's true that it should be ideal, at least to inform people. Um, then I think it maybe it's easier to standardize the minimum curriculum without this kind of technical issue, I'd say. That would be great. And in, so now that we have the opportunity and we have Jenny here, something like that in US? I'll speak really loudly. Um, it is an ethical issue because we don't want to um, shut out other, uh, shut out the potential of institutions and ophthalmologists because of the concerns of visibility. Mm -hmm. program support is 
Yeah, you, you can say we, we, we all, and I used to tend to say, I, I work a lot of with disability kids. Uh, we all have disabilities in life. Uh, I'm SOE Yo Chia and I'm word blind, uh, but I manage in life. I actually also have a PhD. It just took me more time to ty type old things. So it, it, it's, uh, you shouldn't diminish people just because they have uh, challenges. I, I would say also because in ophthalmology, if, if we, we put in such rules, there's the ethical aspect, but the secondly, there's so many roles to play. And these people without depth perception or color blindness or word blindness, they might be the best leaders or they have the best administrative skills you could ever find. You never know what people will become. I'm not trying to diminish it. I was no. just asking, like, did you, do you have it? And it's more about the informative way. Yeah, yeah, Thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. And with this, I will think close the session and uh, go for a break. Next section will be here in uh, Saturday. Faco. Faco. Surgical skills. <laughs>